I started thinking about it, you know, and I, I started thinking, you know what, I guess it really, the way I can best describe it to people is, remember I'm an emergency medicine doc, right? So you get into the certain specialties based on your personality, this, that, and the other. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, emergency medicine can be pretty boring sometimes. You know, you'll be in the emergency department, it's three o'clock in the morning, you go out in the lobby, there's 40 little kids out there with runny noses waiting to see you. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is not what I like. This ain't why I picked emergency medicine. You know, a lot of primary care stuff or whatever. But the reason I stayed in emergency medicine, the reason I was attracted to emergency medicine, the reason I love emergency medicine is because no matter what, at some point or another during every shift, somebody bursts through the doors with the butcher knife sticking out of their chest, right? That's what working in the Trump administration was like every day. <laughs> you get up and you get like, what? He said, what? You get what? You know? You know, they used to call it no drama Obama, which was true, right? I mean, he was just flat all the time. There were no highs, there were no lows. And you get in there with Trump, and it was game on, right? <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't know Trump. When I, first, when I first got there, like I said, I didn't know him. The only reason I ended up getting this job is because I was actually going to retire at the end of the Obama administration, because I already had 20 years. I'd already become a rear admiral. I kind of peaked out, you know, rank wise. I mean, I did get promoted one time after that. But I said, I'm already an admiral. I've already got 20 plus years in. It's time to get out now and go back and do something. But what happened is, uh, when President Trump came in, they didn't know anything about setting up the West Wing or cabinet, you know, cabinet you know, secretary's jobs or any of that kind of stuff. Because he had been president before, you know, he had never done any of this stuff before. Most of the people around him that he trusted hadn't really done it before. So they did the same thing that every president does. They reached out to the last administration from their party uh, and, and helped them. So whenever uh, the transition team got there, almost everybody on the on the Trump transition team were all Bush folks, right? And I mean, and some of them, a lot of them knew me from the Bush years because I'd taken care of those three years of them and their families and so on and so forth. So when they found out I was there, they said, hey, we need you to do us a favor. We got all kinds of balls in the air right now. The med unit's hitting on all unit, on all cylinders. We need you to just stay. And I was like, no, I can't stay. And President Trump didn't really like the guy that was taking my place. He was kind of an introvert. And, they, and so they're like, well, President's not really, you know, President Trump's not really, you know, uh, you know, uh, meshing with the guy, you know, that, that's, that's supposed to be taking your place. And, you know, and, and we just don't want, we, we want everything to go well. So just take this off our plate and just stay. And I said, I can't do it. So they, they kept talking to me about it, talking to me about it. So finally, just days before the inauguration, I agreed to stay. And I said, I'll stay, I'll stay uh, for six months, not any longer. And I'll, I'll make sure that I get like somebody that you guys are happy with. I'll do a turnover. I'll make sure the ball doesn't get dropped. You know, and, and I said, they said, okay, fine. So then I was, I was faced with the realization that I didn't even know President Trump, right? I met him one time when he walked through the White House for a tea, like with the First Lady, went right after the day after he got elected. But I never, he said hi to me and that was it. So I was like, I gotta get to know this guy to do that. But I've been around long enough, I knew how to do it. So, you know, I have an earpiece in there, you know, listen to every movement that happened with, you listen to the Secret Service all the time, right? And they call out every movement of the president. You know, President uh, Trump was uh, mogul and President Bush was trailblazer. These are their call signs. Uh, and President Obama was renegade. They all these different call signs. And so they call out every time he moves, he goes to the bathroom, they call it out, you know, mobile, <laughs> moving to the bathroom. You know, mobile, moving here. They call out all the movements, right? So you can just sit in your chair and do whatever you gotta do. And you always know where the president's at because you're listening to this corner of here. So I would get there in the mornings early, and you guys know that President Trump would show up at he would he would be up at the White House hours before anybody else showed up for work. Hours, right? And uh, you know, he used to tell me that like he, he couldn't stand the press, right? And so he would get up in the mornings, and he would be up like four thirty or five o'clock, and he would go over to the other side where the press, where the where the press, uh, you know, uh, area was at, and he would just flip the lights on and off just so they knew he was up. He would, he would be up for hours before anybody else showed up, and so. I took advantage of that, so I would be in my office listening, you know, and I'd hear Bobo moving to the elevator. And in, in, in the White House, my office is directly below the president's bedroom, right? It's right next to the to the diplomatic reception room in the map room, right across from the elevator where the president comes down from his bedroom on the ground floor of the White House. So I'm the first person to see him every morning, the last person to see him every evening, right? So I, I'd hear that he's moving to the elevator. I'd get up, I'd walk to the you know to, to my door, I'd be standing at my door, he'd walk down and and I, I, I'd go, uh, morning, Mr. President. And he'd go, morning, Doc. And then he would come over and he'd go, did you see this? And did you see that? Because, you know, been up for three hours. By the time he got down in the elevator, he was looking for somebody to talk to, right? Whatever. He was spun up about something, right? And so he'd walk over and I'd be like, yes, sir. Yeah. And then he'd go, and then we start talking and he'd go, uh, you know, and it, 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 was, it, was, it, it was never anything medical, right? It could have been anything, right? It could have been, uh, you know, Iran. It could have been, you know, it, was, it could have been Stormy Daniels. It just whatever. You know? <laughs> Anything that came up, right? It was just whatever was on the news. 
And so I said, yes, sir. And so we'd start talking and he'd go walk with me. So I'd walk him to work every morning. I'd walk him down the West Colonnade, walk him down the Oval Colonnade, right in the back of the Oval Office. And then we'd tie up our conversation and the National Security Advisor, the Chief of Staff, or you know, the CIA briefer, or whoever would be in the outer Oval waiting to come in. I'd finish up my conversation. I'd walk out. They'd come in. His day would start. And so I got to know the president really, really well, really fast, faster than anybody I've ever known. I got to know him. And, and you know, one thing, right off the bat, I just realized I love this man. I, I love this man. Right? I love his attitude. I love his very yes, top of approach. I love, you know, I just love everything about him. I mean, I just had an incredible respect for him. And he developed a lot of trust and confidence in me right off the bat. So the two of us got pretty close. And, you know, one thing led to another, and then, you know, obviously, you guys may or may not remember, I did his physical about a year later, and, uh, you know, the press was coming after him. They tried everything they could possibly think of to get rid of him. Then, you know, so they were like, well, let's just say he's not physically or mentally fit, right? And, and when they're like, well, you know, there was nothing he did that, to give them a reason to think he wasn't mentally fit. They just didn't like, the, they didn't like his tweets, right? They didn't like his, you know, his style. Uh, but they were like, hey, this man's not me mentally or physically fit to be president. So I did it. We did his physical exam. And we did a cognitive exam, and I didn't tell anybody I was doing it, right? Just me and the president, we did it, and I did I didn't do it by myself. I did it with a whole bunch of doctors at Walter Reed and everything when I did this physical. But no one knew I was including a cognitive exam and his physical exam. That's never been done for a president ever. But the press, all these, you know, these uh, these idiots, these liberal elites in academic medicine, you know, they're in the psychiatry department at Yale and Harvard and all these people, you know, New York Times and you know, uh, looking down their nose at all the rest of us, they were like, you know, you should, you know, he needs a he needs a cognitive test. He's not probably gonna be fit to be present. So we did it. He scored 30 out of 30, he crushed it, which I knew he was. Like that, the guy's got incredible memories. Memories way better than mine. I mean, you know, so I, I had no doubt he was going to just crush it, or you know. And so uh, we did the, we did the, the cognitive test, the physical test. I got up there, I briefed it, I went out, I stood in front of the press, which Biden's doctor will not do now. He will not come out and talk to the press. I stood out, and I, Sarah Sanders says, "You're only going to be out there for about ten minutes. You know, go over his physical or whatever, and I'll get you off the podium, right?" And then I was going in there. And President Trump called me in the Oval Office, and, and he goes, "You got to go do the in brief physical." And I said, "This," he goes, "Ronnie, I want you to stay out there and answer every." single question I've Don't you leave until you're done asking questions. I said, yes, sir. So Sarah was like, you 10 minutes. I said, okay. So I went out there. I was out there for an hour and a half. Standing <laughs> and they were asking ridiculous stuff. It got so ridiculous that even the rest of the press were criticizing the, the, the White House press force saying they made themselves look like, they made themselves look foolish like idiots because the stuff they're asking, like, how much TV does he watch? I mean, somebody like, oh, what kind of stuff? I'm not his mother, I don't know. Right? You know so, uh, but you know, it's, it's just, it was ridiculous, the stuff they were asking. Uh, but anyways, what it did is, it took all that stuff off the table. They never talked about it anymore. It just took it off the table. They didn't talk about him not being physically or mentally fit anymore. And it was a feather in my cap because we made the press look stupid in the process. So the press <laughs> loved it, right? But uh, anyways, you know, long story short, fast forward, it just, you know, he developed even more trust and confidence in me. Fast forward, we're here in Florida one day, and uh, we get on the plane, I don't remember if we're in Miami or we're coming back from Palm Beach or where we were. We're flying back to the White House on Air Force One, and the president walks past my cabin, because on Air Force One, it's the president's uh, bedroom, his office, and then my cabin. So he walks past my cabin, he goes, hey, Doc, come up front, I'm to ask you a question. I said, yes, sir. So I walk up front, and I said, I, I you know, walk in the office, and He's sitting behind his desk, and I sit down, I go, yes, sir, what do you need? He goes, I want you to do me a favor. And I said, yes, sir, what do you want? And he goes, I want you to be a member of my cabinet. I said, what? And he goes, I want you to be my VA secretary. And I was like, oh, I said, well, sir. And he goes, he goes, you can do it, right? And I go, well, yeah, I can do it. Where did this come from, sir? And he goes, Ronnie, you're the right guy for the job. He goes, we talk about this stuff all the time. Your, your son's in the military. Your daughter-in-law's in the military. You're in the military. You're all going to be veterans. Every time we talk about the military or veterans, you always bring it back to like, well, how does it help the veterans or whatever? You're not consumed by the bureaucracy, by the you know the, the $300 billion a year budget, you know all of the, you know, the lobby. And, and he goes, you're the right guy for the job. He goes, I know this. He goes, you go home and talk to Jane about it. And he goes, we're going to talk about this tomorrow. And then, where am I on time, by the way? Who cares? Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. 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 Get the time. Keep right. going. So anyway, so what happens is I, uh, you know, I go home and, and I was kind of like, oh my God, are you kidding me? So we landed on, we landed, and I just said, this, this is part of the reason I'm here. We landed on, on, on the south grounds in the helicopter, right? And General Kelly and some of the other senior staff were on board there. I was on board, you know, with the president, right? And then 
uh, we land on the South Grounds and President uh, General Kelly and the rest of the senior staff break off and go to the left over toward the West Wing. And then the President and I are the only ones that go into the White House because that's where he lives and that's where my office is. Everybody else is in the West Wing. So they break off to go to the West Wing. The President and I walk into the to the White House proper. I'm walking right behind him, you know, and he just asked me this. And so he, he stops and he goes, hey, Doc, he goes, uh, he goes, come, he goes, uh, First thing tomorrow morning, let's get to work on this. We're going to do this. He goes, go talk to Jane. We're going to make this happen. I said, yes, sir. And then I was like, crap. I was like, this is happening really fast, right? So I went straight. I acted like I was going back to my office, but I didn't. I just dropped my bag, and I went straight to the West Wing, and I was straight into General Kelly's office. And I said, General Kelly, I said, I got to tell you something. He's the chief of staff at the time, right? And I said, I got to tell you something. And he said, what? And I said, hey, uh, the president just asked me to, to be uh, his secretary of the VA. And he goes, what? Right? He didn't even know. It. He was like, what? And I was like, and I said, yes, sir. He goes, whoa, 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 right? And so he started trying to immediately talk me out of this. Should have been a red flag to me right there, right? And he's immediately trying to talk me out. Said, don't do this, Ronnie. Don't do this. He goes, you're, he goes, you're just such a good friend. And I don't want to say, I couldn't in good conscience tell anybody to do this. You know, I couldn't in good conscience tell anybody to do the job I'm doing right now. This place is horrible. I don't want to see it consume another good man. It was almost like he knew something I didn't know, but he did. But I didn't know that at the time. And he never got to tell me. And so he's telling me all this and everything. And he, and he can, he can kind of sense that I'm probably going to do it anyways, right? So I said, I'm going to talk to Jane or whatever. He goes, I'm not begging you don't do this. But he goes, if you do this, Ronnie, we got to do it the right way. He said, we got to roll this out, right? we got to leak your name out. We want to find out where the vulnerabilities are, right? He goes, we, we'll go ahead and get rid of, uh, you know, the, 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 the current, which was David Shulkin, right? Which I thought David was a nice man. He was a nice guy. He and I got along okay. I thought he did a decent job. We were friends. And, and But everyone in, everyone in D.C., everyone on the planet knew that David Shulkin was getting fired. It wasn't if he was getting fired. It was when he was getting fired. I knew it. David knew it. Everybody knew it. General Kelly knew it. All the staff knew it. It was just when. They were just waiting for the right time to get rid of him and replace him. So everybody knew he was on the chopping block, which is key to the story, too. So I, he, he tells me, just if we're going to do this, we're, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get rid of, uh, to, uh, of, of uh, Secretary Shulkin, and then we'll put an act team in place. We'll leak your name out, find out where our vulnerabilities are and everything, and we'll do this right. And at the time, my promotion for my second star was in the Senate days from being confirmed. I was just two or three days from putting on, or you know, it was probably two or three weeks from putting on my, my second star, right? And he goes, we want to get you promoted. Let's get you promoted first and so on and so forth. And, and it's, to me, it sounded okay because I thought it was happening pretty fast. Here. So I was like, all right, take a deep breath. That sounds good to me. Let's do it that way. Let's see. Let's, I like that plan, right? So I left and I went home and I talked to Jane. And the next morning I got up and you know, the president walks down. And as soon as he walks down, he's like, Doc, walk with me. So I come walking. He goes, we doing this? And I said, yes, sir, we're going to do it. He's like, all right, right? And then he goes, uh, he said, uh, he said, okay, well, he goes, you go back to your office and get some of your stuff done. Come back over. I'll get General Kelly. Listen, I said, well, sir, hey, I was going to let you know. I talked to General Kelly, and General Kelly said, we should slow roll this a little bit. Maybe we should. He goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. And he goes, no, no, we're doing it now. He goes, uh, he goes, we can't do this. We can't. He goes, he's out. You're in. Boom, boom. He goes, boom, boom. He goes, he goes out. You're in. Boom, boom. I said, I said, all right. I said, sir, but. And I said, well, sir, just, you know, I, I know, I, I get it. But I said, General Kelly just thinks like, you know, I was trying to explain it. He wouldn't let me get ready. No, Ronnie, Ronnie. He goes, does General Kelly know this is my decision on his? I go, oh, yes, sir, he knows that. Right? And he goes, boom, boom, we're going to this guy. I said, all right. And he goes, he goes, you go back to office and get your stuff done. He goes, you let me take care of General Kelly. I said, yes, sir. So I, went, I acted like I was going back to my office, but I didn't. I went to the palm room. And I went straight around the outside and I went in through the visitor's entrance of the West Wing straight to the to General Kelly's office and I walked in and I said, Hey General Kelly, we got a problem. He goes, What do you mean? I go, I talked to the president this morning, he wants to do it today. Whoa, no, no, Ronnie. And I was like, and he goes, he goes, we're gonna I said, I told him, sir, I told him what your plan was. And he said he wants to do it today. And he goes, No, 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 he goes, Ronnie, he goes, he goes, you go back to office. He goes, You let me take care of the president. So, <laughs> He goes, he goes, you let me handle the president. I said, okay. So I was like, all right. So I went back to my office, and the president just told me, you let me handle General Kelly, and General Kelly just told me, you let me handle the president. I said, okay, I'm going to go back to my office. So I went back to my office, was doing stuff. You know, the day goes by, it's like maybe 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and you know, and I hadn't heard anything, so I, mean, I got busy, and I'm like, I hadn't had a chance to go back over to the West Wing, so I thought, you know what, General Kelly won that fight, or I would have already heard about it by now, right? Just about that time, Hope Hicks and Sarah Huckabee Sanders walked through my office, and they got these big smiles on their face, and they're like, congratulations. And I'm like, I'm like, what? And they go, and I said, oh, I said to the president, because I didn't think anybody knew about it. I didn't tell anybody about it. Nobody knew about it, right? And I said, oh, did the president tell you guys that he's thinking about nominating me for the VA secretary? And they're like, what? And I go, did you tell you this thing? They're like, you get over there? And I was like, I mean, you better get over there right now. He's going to announce it in 30 minutes. I was like, what? Like, so I rushed over there, and there he is. Everybody's in there. The VP's in there. National Security Advisor's in there. The press secretary's in there. Hope's in there. Uh, you know, the VP's, the whole VP's office is in there. Uh, you know, Dan Scavino's in there working on the tweet. You know, he's getting the tweet. 
sweet thing. He's giving it to the president. The president's chopping it, giving it back to him. He's bringing it back. You know, and he gets it just like he wants it. And I'm standing there going, what the I walk in, everybody's like, congratulations, Mr. Secretary. People are patting me on the back and they're thinking, I don't know, what in the heck is happening, right? And so then he gets, he gets the tweet just like he wants it, and then he takes it and he signs it to me. He writes me a little note and he gives it to me. And he goes, he goes, oh, welcome to the big leagues. And, by, and at that time, General Kelly was in the other room firing Shulkin, right? And then he sends this tweet out and it says, you know, I, to, you know, uh, right now or today, I'm, uh, I'm, you know, we're firing, uh, you know, Secretary Shulkin. Uh, we're making Robert Wilkie the acting, and Ronnie Jackson is going to be my nominee for the Secretary of the VA, right? And I was the nominee for Cabinet Secretary position, just like that. It was crazy, right? And here's what I did, though, and here's the only reason I'm standing before you right now, is because that's not what was going on behind the scenes, right? So, this is where I learned what the deep state's really like, right? Because it turns out, that, like I said, everyone knew that this guy was on the chopping block, Shulk, and everybody knew he was leaving, right? It was a done deal, right? They had already, when I see that, when I say they, I mean the deep state, right? They had already picked a replacement for him, right? But it wasn't the president's choice, it was their choice. And they had already picked Dr. Wilkie, right? Dr. Wookie's a he's a great guy. He did a good job as secretary. Says, I don't have any hard feelings towards him at all. If I would have done the same thing, if they said, hey, you want to be the cabinet secretary? Or you want to be the acting? And then, you know, so he, you know, I, this is nothing against him. He did a good job. But the issue here is that he had worked in the Senate Veterans Affairs Committee for a long time for Senator Tillis. And he knew Senator Tillis. He knew Johnny Isaacson, who was the chair of the Veterans Affairs Committee. He knew John Tester, who was the moron who came after me and tried to destroy me and my family. You know, he knew everybody else who was on the Senate Affairs Committee. He just left there. He went to the Pentagon where he worked for a couple of years and he worked for Mattis and Kelly, right? And so basically what I figured out after the fact is they had picked this guy a long time ago, long before the president put my name out there, but they knew the president didn't know him. The president wasn't going to nominate him. didn't even know him. So their plan was like, let's fire Shulkin. Let's bring Wilkie in as the acting. Let's get him some face time with the president, get some wins under his belt, and then we're going to convince the president that he should be our nominee, right? But then they didn't know, what they didn't know is out of nowhere the president was going to throw my name in the hat, right? So I lived through this deep state garbage, man. They, they thought I was going to fall on my sword from an experience standpoint. I was going to be able to make it, and they were counting on that. I studied my butt off. They came over here. The VA was outside my office and I had all these, I had like 30 people trying to get me ready for my confirmation here and I'd get there in the morning. As soon as I finished a brief, I'd open the door. Five people would walk out. Five people would walk in. I, I didn't even eat. And they had murder boards set up in the Indian treaty room at night, like the like the Senate confirmation room where they grilled me at night. I was killing it. I met with uh, like 60-something senators on the Hill, one-on-one, uh, talking to them about this. And they realized, like, this guy's going to get on TV and C-SPAN or wherever they do this crap, and he's going to inspire confidence in the American people. We're going to we're gonna have to confirm this guy. So what did they do? They went to Plan B. Plan B was to destroy me on a personal level, right? So they made up all this garbage. They got some disgruntled employees that had worked for me in the past. One of them who's currently Biden's position, right? Uh, and and, and they, they basically used their, uh, their legislative affairs connections, went and talked to John Tester, who's a horrible, horrible Democrat. I don't know if you remember if you guys know who this fat three-fingered idiot is, but uh, he's from Montana. He's a complete moron. And he's gone on TV and started pushing out all this garbage about me. He's on CNN and MSNBC saying ridiculous stuff like, um, you know, well, you know, he uh, he went to a Secret Service party, got drunk, and wrecked a government vehicle. I'm like, what? I'm like, you need to investigate it and figure out in about 10 minutes whether that did or didn't happen, right? I've never been in an accident involving alcohol my entire life. Never even been to a Secret Service Christmas party. And the crazy thing is, if you go back and look at the, in the Washington Post, that actually happened to a Secret Service agent about a year before that. That was the exact same story. Went to a Secret Service party, got drunk, and wrecked his government, government vehicle coming back in the gate. It's like they cut his name out of the story, pasted mine in, and recycled it. And the press knew it. They just ran with it, right? So they just tried to destroy me. They tried to destroy my family. Jamie, my kids couldn't even leave the house. There was press camped out in my driveway all the time. They were harassing my kids. I mean, I tell people now I got Kavanaugh before Kavanaugh did. I just didn't know it. I was a warm up. I was the free game, but I didn't know it. But I'm not the person then. Or I wasn't the person then that I am now, right? I'd never been exposed to anything like this. I wasn't a politician. So as time went on, I was like, you know what? I was like, this is crazy, man. So I told the president, I said, I think it's starting to impact, you know, your ability to get a good cabinet secretary. It's starting to have an impact on the veterans themselves and on the department. And I said, I think it's time for me to withdraw my nomination. He didn't really want me to, but I did. And so, and he goes, he goes, Ronnie, I don't want you to leave. So he wanted me to come back and be his doc again, but I'd already been doing that for so long. I was looking for an exit strategy already on that. You know, I've been doing it 14 years. 
And so I said, well, sir, I, the guy that's doing it's doing a great job and everything. And the guy that I turned over to, and he goes, well, I want you to leave. I'm going to promote you to assistant to president. I'm going to make you my chief medical advisor. I want you to stay here with me. So I said, okay. So he did, and I stayed, and I moved over to the policy side and worked on health care policy and things of that nature. Right? So it was great. But uh, I'll tell you, um, you know, for like the next six, eight months, I just like, I was just, my heart wasn't in it. I hated that damn place. I hated DC. I was like, I can't stand. I can't stand this place. It's disgusting. It's a swamp. It's a sewer. I can't stand the people here. Right? I mean, I just was disgusted with DC. So was Jane. So was my family. And so I was looking to get out of there. But I'd already kind of committed to him that I would do this job. So I couldn't leave right away. So I kind of sucked it up and tried to do this job. Like I said, my heart wasn't in it. But what it did is it led me to right here where I'm standing because I turned the TV on one morning. <laughs> I turned the TV on one morning and I saw on TV, I was like, you know, and I never, I'm telling you, I promise you, this is not an exaggeration. I never thought about running for office before, ever. It was like, God just came into my life and I had this epiphany, right? And I'm looking at the TV and I'm getting dressed for the work at the White House. And I look at the TV and I see Matt Thornberry, who was a congressman in the district I'm in now. He'd been there for 26 years, waiting until the last minute. And he suddenly said he wasn't going to run again, right? So I'm looking at that. And that's the area of Texas I grew up in. And I think that back, this was October of 2019, right? So everybody, the Democrats, everybody thought for sure Trump was getting a, a second term, right? Because all the indicators you look at, the economy and everything else, through the roof. I mean, there's no way he wasn't getting reelected, which he did. But, you know, COVID happened, right? We had COVID and all this, stuff. this was before COVID, so nobody knew that kind of that all that crap was in the store. So I was looking at the TV and I thought, man, Trump's getting a second term, right? Thornberry is leading in this district, and I can go up to that district. I can represent those folks in that district without changing anything about who I am, politically, socially, culturally, economically. I'm on the same page. And then I thought to myself, I'm getting out of the Navy. You know, I'm already, I've already got 20 years. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about putting my retirement paperwork in as soon as I can. And I thought, this is a perfect opportunity to get in the fight and do something about what's going on. Not talk about it, not bitch about it, not complain about it, but do something about it, right? So I, uh, I went to work that day at the White House. I walked around all day. I thought about it more. By the end of the day, I didn't even think it was an opportunity anymore. I thought it was a duty to get in the fight and do something about it. I walked straight into the Oval Office at the end of the day. You know, the President was in there doing something. I walked right past the Oval Secretary, right in the Oval Office. And I said, sorry, stop what you're doing. I'm going to talk to you. And he goes, what's going on? I said, I'm leaving. He's like, what? He's, you know, thought I was doing something wrong with my family or something. I said, no, sir, I'm running for office. He's like, what? What, where, what, and, you know, and so then we talked about him, but, you know, some of his political people in, everything, we, we just, and he, but I walked out of the office that day, and I was in the fight, and I'm like, I'm running for office, right? Yeah. I love his honesty. And so, you know, I, uh, I, you know, what happened is basically is, uh, you know, I, I had a very limited time, because you have to get out of the military on the first day of the month. This is the end of October, right? The filing deadline, as somebody mentioned, was like the first week of December, right? So I had to get out on November the 1st or December the 1st, or I would miss the filing deadline and it was off the table. You can't talk about running, you can't have anything to do with running for office while you're on active duty. So I had I couldn't do it by November 1st, that was like three or four days away. So I saw the, uh, the, uh, the Secretary of Defense and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs walking out of the, out of the situation room the next morning, I stopped them. I said, hey, I'm going to talk to you guys. And they said, what's up? And I told them, I said, I'm thinking about getting out. They said, well, I'm going to run for office. They said, okay. And I said, I need some help. And they're like, what do you need from us? And I said, well, I need to get out by December the 1st. And they're like, that's like four and a half weeks away, Ronnie. They, Have you done anything yet? Because it usually takes six months to get out of the military, right? And I said, I haven't done anything yet. And they're like, oh, I don't know if you can do that or not. And they said, here's the deal. We'll just tell you that if you if you get your stuff on our desk, we won't sit on it. We'll just get it out of here. I said, okay. So that. I got, I got, my, I started getting my stuff together. I think it was Wednesday morning. I started working on it, uh, and I got it all. I got it all. I started working on it a few days before that. I think it might have been Monday morning. I started working on it. I had everything ready to go. I had my package put together and everything in two days. So I, uh, on uh, Wednesday morning, I put my package in. By Friday, close of business, I had retirement orders, so I was able to get out. But I got out on December the first. And I got, I, I, I got read out of some programs I was in. I resigned from the White House and I retired from active duty both on December the 1st, 2019, went straight to Texas, picked up a truck that I bought, in, in, uh, a, a used truck I bought in Dallas, drove straight to Austin. I filed two hours before the filing deadline. There were already 15 Republicans in the race. And so it was crazy. But, uh, I'm so sure I ended up getting elected. I got in here, but I just say that because, you know, one of the things I'll tell you is, uh, you know, um, the thing that the reason that I think that I that, that, that I, you know that I'm supposed to be here, I'm supposed to be doing this job is because it was a miserable situation going through all that. But it changed me. Like I said before, I'm not the same person now that I was then. The biggest difference right now, my family's not the same either. The biggest difference right now is I do not give a damn what they say about me anymore. Right? <laughs> 
I learned that from the process I went through, and I learned a lot of that from Donald Trump, right? I learned a lot of that from him. You know, my time in the military was never about politics. It was, it was about duty and service to my country. My job was to take care of the office of the presidency and protect the commander in chief and the first family. My time in the White House did, however, taught me about the important attributes of the office of the presidency, what it takes to make a great president. It did teach me that. Uh, chief among those qualities is a genuine desire, genuine desire to make America great and to help the people be the greatest and the safest that they can possibly be, right? You know what it also taught me? It taught me there's a group of people at the highest reaches of government that do not share these values. They don't, you know, I just, I just uh, talked about some of that, but it's worse than that now. Way worse than that now, right? It was during my time in the Trump administration that this all changed for me, just like I talked about. But, uh, you know, needless to say, uh, you know, I, I have a unique disgust for D.C. And, uh, and I, I just don't, you know, and I just want to tell you guys thank you. I tell people in my district this all the time. I just want to say thank you because, you know, for people like me, people like Byron, uh, you know, uh, people, you know, that, that are on the front, the front lines of this, that are outspoken to say what needs to be said. People in D.C. would just as soon spit on us as look at, us, and look at us, right, or talk to us. They hate us, right? They despise us. And so, you know, it, it's hard to go there and to do this day after day, but the only reason you can do it is because you come back home to your district and you come to places like this where people tell you thank you, they pat you on the back, and they tell you you're doing a good job. And this is the I'm just going to read a little bit of some of the stuff I read, I read here, but I'm, I'm just going to tell you that, you know, the reason I'm fighting is I'm fighting because of deep, I've seen that deep state bureaucracy up close and personal. I decided when I was going to run against the deep state back then, you know, when Trump first started running, they, they worked kind of from within. They worked, uh, you know, uh, behind the scenes, kind of in the dark to line their own pockets, create power for themselves and at the expense of everyday Americans. But they, and they were inspired. They were inspired by President Trump and the fear of him. You know, he's the person who came in, he said he was going to drain the swamp. The reason they hate him, and it's not just Democrats that hate him, it's Democrats and it's a whole lot of rhino Republicans that hate him, right? Why? Why? Because look at these rhino Republicans like Mitch McConnell, these people that have been in the Senate for a while. These people have been there so long. You know, the swamp, they love the swamp just like the Democrats do. The swamp is where they thrive. So that's where they get their authority, their power, their influence. That's where all that comes from, their money. And they, they, you know, so they, when, when they saw Donald Trump actually draining the swamp, they were terrified. Everybody wanted to damage control. And the rhino Republicans, you know, Mitt Romney's and Mitch McConnell's yeah. and Liz Cheney's and all these people got together with all the Democrats and, and they, they, they conspired you know, to destroy this man. And they're doing it to this very day. They're still coming after him, right? Yeah. Uh, but you know, they were inspired by this, but you know, many of us were inspired by that as well. But they, they pushed the lies, they didn't undermine President Trump's agenda, they perm and perm permanently tarnish his legacy, and, and destroy anyone that's associated with him, anyone, right? Uh, they, of course, still do this, but the, the, the weird thing is now is they do it boldly and out in the open. They make no attempt to hide it. They don't care if everyone knows that they are corruptly and illegally taking your rights and your personal freedoms away from you. They don't care anymore, right? right. They have completely weaponized every government agency to persecute, punish, and destroy and jail their political enemies, right? And anyone that questions their authority. You know, we're rapidly becoming the Soviet Union, right? Or communist China. And I don't say this lightly, but this is how Nazi Germany started, right? I mean, this is terrifying. This is terrifying, right? And if I had said that, if I had compared, you know, our country, uh, you know, what's happened in our country to Nazi Germany three years ago, most of you would have said I was completely crazy, and some of you would have said I was completely out of the line. But unfortunately, we all know it's true right now, and it's sad, but we know it's we we know that's where we're headed. Um, and even worse, you know, the weaponization of organizations like the FBI, the DOJ, the IRS is now coupled with the Democrats' total disdain for legitimate law and order, right? Their demonization of law enforcement, their promotion of racist ideologies like CRT and DEI, their sexualization and mutilation of our children in the name of trans rights, their reckless, unrestrained government spending and destruction of our economy, their woke takeover of our military, their disastrous failures on the international stage, and their dangerous, dangerous facilitation of the Mexican cartels, and their drug trafficking, sex trafficking, and murderous gangs. All of which has caused irreversible damage to our country. This is why I ran for Congress. This is why I decided I would not stand on the sidelines any longer and watch. Because like everyone in this room, I'm worried about the future of my kids and my grandkids. Until we get this fixed, nothing else matters, right? I'm actually 
Jesus is truly on the brink right now, losing everything we hold dear, never getting it back. I mean, this might be our one chance to get this back. And your people say it's the most important election in your life every time there's an election. But by God, we know it this time. We know it's the most important election of our life. The good news is, the good news is, like President Trump, like I, and many Florida congressional colleagues of mine, and all of you here in this room, we have a deep, genuine commitment to America first and to stand up for what we believe in. And I'm personally, I'm proud to be on the tip of that spear and fight for these changes in Congress and to fight to restore the greatness of this country. You know, you may ask what that fight looks like. I'll tell you, you know, uh, when I get back uh, tomorrow to Congress, I'm not going to really be welcomed welcome with open arms by Kevin McCarthy. Uh, I'm kind of on the outs with him right now. And the reason is because the, the, the garbage that goes on in D.C. right now, right? We've had ultimate opportunities. You know what? When we pass, people in the Republican Party have bitched and complained forever about the spending that's going on in this country, right? Yep. And what we're spending the money on, the priorities and the amount of money that we're spending. And it's true. For the first two years I was in Congress, the Democrats controlled the, they controlled the, uh, the, the House, the Senate, and the and White House. We were spending money like it was going out of style. It was Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, and Joe Biden's agenda. They decided what we spent the money on. It was all of this you know, woke social garbage, and it was the Green New Deal and all this stuff that they're spending money on. We complained about that. What happened? We had the opportunity. We got the House back in January, right? The House of Representatives is supposed to control the purse strings. We were all excited because for the first time, we're going to have the opportunity to choke off the money, right? And we may not get any legislation passed, but we can certainly stop them from doing some of this stuff. We can defund those 87,000 IRS agents and all this other stuff. Right? We can choke that money off. But you know what happened? We were supposed to be able to do that on, on, on January 1st. You know what happened? At the end of the year, last year in December, you remember this, at the end of the year, when they still had the House, they still had the Senate, they still had the White House, before they turned over to the new Congress, what they did is they passed they, they, they passed the omnibus, $1.7 trillion omnibus bill. What did that omnibus bill do? That omnibus bill extended the Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, Joe Biden priorities, and all of the reckless spending all the way out until October 1st of this year. It took our ability to, to utilize the first things away from us, right? How did that pass? Almost every Republican in the House of Representatives voted against it, but it didn't matter because they had the majority. Remember back in December, they had the majority, so it passed out of the House anyways. Well, it has to get 60 votes in the Senate. Well, I thought for sure it's going to die in the Senate. There's no way this thing should get 60 votes in the Senate. Guess what? They only have 50 votes. There's no way they get 60. I mean, they need 10 Republican votes. 17 Republicans voted for it in the Senate. 17 Rhino Republicans voted for this. It passed the Senate. The President signed it. It locked us into these spending priorities until October 1st of this year. Now what's happening? Where we're supposed to pass all of these appropriations bills, 12 of them in fact. We passed one, right? They're all supposed to be passed before September 30th of this year. We passed one. We're going to go back now. What are they talking about now? Continuing resolution. What does a continuing resolution do? It extends that omnibus for another two or three months or six months or whatever they say. Once again, extending Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer's, and, and Joe Biden's reckless spending, their priorities, spending all the garbage that we don't that we, we don't agree with, right? And they they want to extend that. So I, I made a comment. I was on Bannon's show and I was talking, and I didn't mean it to be uh, very controversial, but it came out. And I was just talking, and I was just basically just painting the reality. And I told I told him, I said, well, here's the thing. I said, you know, if they get ready to pass a continued resolution, I said, it'll probably pass because a lot of Republicans won't vote for it. I said, there's no way I'm voting for continued resolution, right? Unless some stuff happens. But I said, I'm not voting for continued resolution. A lot of Republicans won't. Well, guess what? A bunch of Democrats will. And they'll have enough people to pass it, right? Because look what happened when they raised the debt ceiling. When they raised the debt ceiling a few months ago, that left and it had more votes from Democrats in the House of Representatives than Republicans. And it's a Republican-controlled House of Representatives. And that bill passed with more Democrat votes than Republican votes. So I just told Steve Bannon, I said, here's the deal. I will not vote for a CR unless there's significant stuff in there that sends a strong, un, you know, un, un, completely unambiguous message to the FBI and the DOJ that we will not tolerate their garbage anymore, right? We will, you know, everything, unless there's something in there to shut our border down, right? So unless we, sense, unless we punish the FBI, the DOJ, and shut the border down, I'm not voting for CR. And then Bannon said to me, he said, well, what happens if they do the same thing they did with the debt ceiling again and they just reach across the aisle and they work with Hakeem Jeffries, the leader over on the, uh, on the minority side, and they get these votes? And I said, well, I'm gonna tell you right now. I said, if that happens, I guarantee you it's inevitable that somebody's going to call to vacate the chair and Kevin yeah. McCarthy won't be our speaker anymore. Yeah. 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 
I pretty much gotta wrap it up a little bit. I was just gonna tell you real quick, you know, I mean, I mean, this is, you know, I mean, I learned a lot of things when I was in the White House, and I learned what it took, like I told you, to be a good president. I also learned, you know, uh, <laughs> watching TV and and, and, and and you know, looking at Joe Biden every day, uh, what a disaster it is if you're not, you know, if you're not cognitively <laughs> capable of doing your job. This guy's an absolute disaster. You know, he struggles. Uh, you know, he doesn't know where he's at, what he's doing. He doesn't know what's going on. He, he has no clue about what's happening. So. Uh, I, uh, you know, I'm pushing hard to make sure we get rid of Joe Biden. I think that, you know, the impeachment inquiry is going to start at this point. We have enough, enough information right now to impeach the, uh, the Biden crime family. I'm going to speed up a little bit here. I'm going to read this last part. I'm going to get the hook. I'm sorry. I was going to talk also about the disasters and the talk about Afghanistan and all that. That's important for what we're doing here at 9-11. I'm just going to tell you real quick. Let me just jump ahead here. You know, uh, uh, the Biden administration, you know, uh, they, they, they're, they're working in a strong military, and, uh, you know, we're going to jump ahead here. I really want to, I really want to read the end of this, because uh, I spent some time writing, writing this, so I want to read it to you. Uh, but I just want to say, you know, for the, for the sake of this country, we, we've got to get rid of Joe Biden. This man's got to go, right? Uh, even worse than the complete incompetence that we've been witnessing for the past two years are the new revelations that our president's nothing more than the boss of an organized crime family, right? He's made millions and millions of dollars that have spread out among his family members in turn for access to the White House for political favors while serving as the vice president of our country. You know, my fellow patriots, I'm going to tell you right here, the documentation of the Biden administration, which I didn't have time to go over all of it. There's pages and pages of it out here I skipped. But if we could go on all night talking about this. We could talk about the disaster on our southern border where tens of millions of illegals cross our border every year. Some we know about, some we don't. They include gang members, cartel members, drug traffickers, human sex traffickers, and radical Islamic terrorists. We could talk about the 300 deaths a day due to the fentanyl crossing our border. We could talk all night about the weaponization of our own government against us, the IRS, the the FBI, the DOJ, the SEC, the EPA, the CDC, the FDA could go on and on. They're all being weaponized against conservatives in this country right now. We could talk about the racist and sexist brainwashing of our children. We could talk about the politicization of COVID pandemic, the cover up of the origins of COVID, and the corruption that we've uncovered with NIH and WHO and the corrupt public, you know, so called public servants like Dr. Anthony Fauci. Let me tie it up here and just suffice it to say, we're living in a dangerous and unprecedented, challenging time right now. And the failures of the Biden administration have been numerous and concerning. However, our movement cannot afford to lose hope right now, okay? We have a chance to turn things around and make America great again, again, okay? Uh, we do. We have a chance to elect a true and tested fighter who will put America first. I endorse President Trump the minute he announced that he's running for president again. He is the only man who has proven that he can do the job again in 2024. Great leadership demands more than just empty promises and platitudes. It requires a clear and bold vision that inspires and unites those that you lead. And let me tell you, President Trump is the man with the vision. I know this, and you know this. In order to save this country, the person that we elect in 2024 is going to have to do unprecedented things, things that presidents have never had to consider before. President Trump has shown time and time again that he has the strength, the courage, and the foresight to make the tough decisions and to lead this great nation to even greater heights. President Reagan uh, could have never imagined the horrible situation that this country is in today, but he was absolutely right when he said in his inaugural address that the government is not the solution to our problems, the government is the problem. Democrats have the will, the will to use the power of government today to take control of every aspect of your life. President Reagan also famously said that freedom is a fragile thing and is never more than one generation away from extinction. It is not ours by way of inheritance. It must be fought for and defended constantly by each generation. These were his words in the early 1980s, and I can't think of a better example than what we're seeing right now to prove that point. Democrats are coming after every freedom that we hold dear in this country. We know what we're getting if we get President Trump back. When President Trump makes a promise, President Trump delivers and keeps that promise. When President Trump retakes control of the White House in 2024, we will drain the Washington, D.C. swamp of the traitors. We will restore respect for our allies and adversaries. We will, we will know the truth behind every lie that has been told. We will hold every corrupt bureaucrat accountable. We will put the American people first, and we will make America great again. Again, thank you. I appreciate you all coming. Congressman, thank you so much. Larry, thank you for special family. Larry.
Yeah. And he also ahead, confirms sir. that Obama's wife is actually a woman. He answers the question. Why I'll let this man off the stage. Uh, you know, we all around him and never, never hear anything.